which brings us to the most anticipated trend. I love it. Great one. Most anticipated trend of 2023 related to yours. I went with austerity. I have a friend who sometimes flies private often, and I was talking to him about his Christmas vacation. This friend of mine, Shamath, instead of flying private to his vacation, he had to pick up his kids. He had to go back and forth. He was driving his car. That was three hours. That was you. Oh, okay. I didn't want to. I didn't want to declug you. Yeah. But I it was had a so, friend. Uh, it was named so Shabbat great. Who would normally fly private to Lake Tahoe? And he's like, "No, I can't go out with you skiing on Friday. I got to pick up my kids, and then I'm driving back." I said, "Wait a second. How are you doing that?" He's like, "I'm driving a car." I said, "What? Who's driving the car?" He said, "I'm driving the car," and that's why I say austerity is my anticipated trend of twenty twenty three. I agree with you. I actually think this is a really good opportunity to pull back on so much waste. Mm. I haven't really looked at my household budget in probably two or three years. Didn't even bother. Why? And then and then when I looked at it, I was like, wow, this is really inflated to a level mm -hmm. that I didn't expect. Yes. But it makes a lot of sense to live in a more heads down, austere way. I don't know. Yeah. I Well, I mean, look at tonight's menu. You went with duck. I, I guess the olive fed wagyu, everything's off the menu now. No black truffles. We're having duck. We're, we're oh, down to just, poultry. That's just Next week, we're going to have pasta. It's okay, Chamath. <laughs> Austerity measures think, for everybody. They call, Sachs? It, they call it foul for a reason, right? Oh, God. Sachs, uh, <laughs> do you buy into austerity where Ch Ch Chamath and I are austerity bell tightening as our trends? Where, where are you? What's your trend for? I think that's a pretty good trend. Hmm. The trend that I am going to suggest uh, will be to your great disappointment, J. Cal, which is. Hmm. Trump's influence in the GOP continues to wane. You're seeing it in real time right mm. now. The headline is Trump's endorsement proves worthless to Kevin McCarthy in the speaker bid. Even the MAGA faithful like Matt Gates, like Lauren Boebert, they are ignoring Trump's pleas to get behind my Kevin. And in fact, they're kind of not just defying him, but making fun of him. Matt Gates had a repost to Trump saying sad exclamation point. And Bobert was saying that Trump needed to get behind her movement. So we have now a level of, of open defiance to Trump and the GOP. His endorsements just not, are not what they once were. And even if somehow Kevin McCarthy pulls this off, I think all that means is that Trump gets blamed for every swampy rhino compromise that McCarthy has to make to keep the government running over the next two years. So it's a lose-lose. Does that mean that populism is on the wane, do you think? Like, because the, it's the electorate that got him elected in the first place. He was not very popular with politicians. The, he was kind of an outcast when he got elected the first time. And that may be the case now, but he still got elected because the population loved him. People loved him. Is that going to happen? Do you think that means that the populism is kind of waning or the interest of the, the voters is waning on him? Or is it just the political party's alignment Bobert with him? only. Bobert only won by a few thousand votes. She didn't exactly crush it in Colorado. I think a lot of this has to do with Trump's personal standing after the midterms. The candidates that he personally picked that were all in tough races, they all basically lost. It was about the distraction he caused by making the 2020 election such a big deal, constantly looking backwards. So I think the Republican Party doesn't like the antics. It's not about the policies, I don't think. I think it's 100% about the uh, about Trump's electability and about his ability to get things done. And it's not really about uh, the positions per se. So I think Freebird to answer your question, I think that the future of the GOP will incorporate this populism, but it's going to find a better integration with the establishment wing of the Republican Party. And future candidates will have to basically satisfy both of those wings of the party. Sachs, was it was the straw that, or maybe the two straws that broke the camel's back for Republicans and Trump in that relationship, was it January 6th and the election denial? Like for Republicans, is it just like, come on, those are the two things? This constant focusing on the 2020 election, first, it cost them, the cost of Republicans that Georgia runoff seat with Purdue against Warnock. Purdue won on election night, didn't clear 50%, had to go to the runoff. This was happened the day before January 6th. This happened on January 5th of 2021. That was the first race where Trump's antics cost him. Then you had this midterm election where, you know, all the candidates who had to appease Trump by talking about, again, the last election, instead of looking to the future, they got punished by the, the voters. I think Republicans want to win. I mean, they're tired of losing. It's that simple. It's that simple. Yeah. The job of a politician is to win. Freeberg, you got an anticipated trend of 2023.
I am excited about and want to share the point of view that I think um, cell and gene therapies are becoming more mainstream. So these are pharmaceutical modalities where we use uh, gene editing systems where you can actually mm. go in and change or add uh, genetic material to cells in your body to resolve things like genetic diseases or change protein deficiencies or introduce new proteins. And then cell therapies where we engineer cells, put them in the body, and those cells go and do things like attack and destroy cancer cells, for example. There are currently 27 FDA-approved cell and gene therapies on the market. There are over a 1,000 in clinical trials, many of which are already showing extraordinary efficacy and benefit. Today, these therapies cost upwards of a million dollars. So I think there's a massive, and talking about the infrastructure investment conversation earlier, because of the number of diseases and the number of conditions and the number of people that these therapies can treat, I think there's massive infrastructure investment opportunity coming forward this year, but also seeing these come to market, come out of the clinical trials, get FDA approved, we have to ramp up and build up the infrastructure needed because it's not traditional where you make a drug in a factory and send it to people and they get it injected. These are much more complex. They require a much more complicated delivery mechanism. You have to have systems to engineer cells and edit them and put them back in your body. Those systems today take days or weeks and cost, you know, as a result, a million dollar plus per treatment. So I think that um, the cell and gene therapy opportunity, you know, the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference starts this week. Uh, it's the biggest biotech and healthcare conference in the world, starts in San Francisco on Monday. This is uh, one of the biggest areas of interest and, and one that everyone's investing against. Um, but as these come to market, there's, you know, we talked about this last week, genetic diseases, types of cancer that are going to be addressed. And I, I'm really excited about seeing more of these products come to market right. and seeing the whole kind of infrastructure and delivery system change. All right. Sorry to interrupt. Trying to keep the trains moving. Gene editing. Very good choice. All right. We end with this. It's a little bit fun. 